Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. My name is Roberto Schaefer. I'm a professor at the Energy Planning Program of the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. <clears throat> and I'm going to be the moderator of today's uh, webinar, which will be led by Dr. Uh, Shinichiro Fujimori. But before I pass the word to him, let me make a big, big uh, let's say, a brief presentation or introduction of uh, what we're going to be seeing today. So let me share my, my screen with you. Hopefully you, you can see my screen. Okay, so in this introduction, I'm going to very briefly uh, talk about the IMC, which is the Integrated Assessment Modeling Consortium. Uh, is a consortium that have a mission uh, is split in three, in three major issues here. Let's say the idea is to facilitate and foster the development of integrated assessment models and to, to, to conduct research employing uh, those models, including model diagnosis, intercomparisons, and also coordinated uh, studies. Also, let's say one of our missions here is to facilitate and coordinate integrated assessment model research uh, conducted both uh, in terms of climate modeling, but also impact adaptation and vulnerability. So idea here is to try to, to put together these different research communities. And finally, also is our mission to provide a point of contact with other institutions and organizations uh, interacting uh, with the IMC, uh, with the IAM uh, community. Uh, the, the way we operate, we have five scientific groups, which we call uh, SWGs, and we have one scientific group on data protocols and management. We have one scientific group on evaluation and diagnosis, one scientific group on scenarios, another one scenarios for climate-related financial analysis, which is a quite new uh, working group, and finally, the most recent one, which is going to be somehow officially launched during the upcoming IMC meeting in December in, 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 in the US, which is the National Scenarios uh, Working Group. The membership of the IMC uh, community is of 67 members, 28 countries, and four continents are represented uh, in our community. Uh, we have, let's say, a, a series of awards that we, we give every year or almost every year. And today we are going to focus on this award, which is the award for extraordinary contribution in the field of IM, which is the ECA award. And this uh, award uh, for extraordinary contribution to the field of integrated assessment model is given for a specific extraordinary contributions uh, during the past two years. It recognizes those that have made outstanding scientific contributions to the field of IM and or have uh, made significant contributions to the IM community formation and or have increased the impact of the IMC uh, community. Uh, in principle, this prize is awarded every year, but only if one or more are with deserving the prize uh, were nominated. So here we see a list of eight awardees. Let's say that the first one was uh, uh, Detlef Van Vuren in 2012, then Elmar Krigler 2013, then Leon Clark 2015, K1 Hiari 2016, Brian O'Neill 2017, Kate Calvin 2019, myself 2020, and now the most recent awardee uh, Shinichiro Fujimori, uh, who is the, the one that's going to be making the, his uh, presentation today. F finally, uh, I just want to use this opportunity to announce uh, the 15 IMC annual meeting that's going to take place uh, between 28th November and 2 December 2022. And it's going to be in College Park, Madison, uh, US. And it's going to be a in person. Uh, meeting, although we're gonna also going to have the possibility of some people joining uh, online. Registrations are now open. 
So please pay attention to that and hope to see you, most of you uh, joining us uh, in, in College Park uh, this year. Okay, so with, this, with the, the, those initial words, I would like to now to introduce our speaker of today, which is Dr. Dr. Shinichiro Fujimori, who was awarded with the extraordinary contributions to the field of IM uh, award uh, last year. Dr. Fujimori has been contributing to the IMC community for many years by now. Uh, his experience and influence in the field has contributed to the development of IM related studies, especially in Asian countries. Dr. Fujimori uh, is, is from the University of Kyoto. He has played a remarkable role in expanding the field of IM beyond Japan to other parts of Asia, which is critically important as well. Over the last few years, Dr. Shinichiro has been an extremely important force in supporting this effort. And finally, his active and central involvement in, in both policy relevant analysis and expansion of our IM community are activities well aligned with those of the IMC and make him a truly deserving recipient of award. So it's a great honor to have here Dr. Shinichiro Fujimori joining us today, and he's gonna be making his presentation. So Dr. Fujimori, thank you very much for being with us. So the, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Roberto. Uh, let me share my screen now. Can you see? I hope. Yes. All right. Uh, thanks again uh, for introducing uh, me. And uh, it, it's a really great uh, honor for me to get the that award. And uh, I, I am actually I was really surprised to get this award, and I I didn't expect that at all. And uh, after that, I I made a movie. In, giving the comments regarding on this award and uh, there I, I indicated but I, I would like to restate here that my award uh, is, is not only my contribution but it's a sort of a uh, uh, you know cumulative uh, uh, assets of uh, a modeling team uh, which has started from 1990 and uh, so today I would like to start from uh, the history of our uh, aim and then moving on to recent activities, which is mainly uh, undertaken by uh, my leadership, uh, like here. And I, I, as I said, uh, I, I think it, it, uh, my activity is actually based on, on the past uh, really great founder of this aim teams and and therefore, uh, my presentation content is actually very limited, and I would like you to understand my my contribution is a uh, really small portion of uh, entire AIM uh, activity over the past three decades. And so, uh, finally, I would like to also uh, take this opportunity to advertise the SWGs on national scenarios. So let, let me start from AIM modeling team introductions. So uh, the aim, uh, there is no formal aim definition, but it's, it's a kind of an international collaboration network program, uh, which is initiated by a, a National Institute for Environmental Studies, uh, where I worked uh, previously for around 80 years. And, but at the same time, uh, NICE has a uh, quite tight uh, research collaboration with uh, Kyoto University, and now I'm uh, affiliated at this uh, university. And then we have, you know, uh, multi-e-connection networks like shown in this year, uh, China, India, Thai, uh, Indonesia, uh, and so on. Uh, here, uh, th there is an, a list of institutions, but I think uh, it, uh, whole network uh, developed in, in Asian countries is, is not only them, but other uh institutes are also or partly involved in a uh, researches and let me briefly talk about the history here uh so uh maybe before 1990 he, he, the original founder uh snake uh 
Yuzuru Matsuoka and Mikiko Kainuma uh, started this kind of uh, AIM project uh, activities. And then they, if uh, uh, from the uh, literature, I can see that uh, in 1990, there was a sort of a, uh, some solid uh, modeling uh, simulation tool, uh, which is called A. Uh, at that time, the impact model uh, was described. And then uh, 1992, uh, first AIM-induced model, uh, which is a, a energy system model, uh, was developed. And then um, we joined uh, the long-term emission scenario development from uh, 1993, which I think uh, uh, contributed to IS-92 scenario or uh, under the, the you know, uh, IPCC process. And then uh, 1996, first AIM International Workshop uh, was held. And uh, the, this is an annual in, uh, international workshop. Uh, still uh, this year, we had like a 25th or something like that, uh, 28th, sorry. Um, uh, every year we have continuously, we have this uh, international workshop and keep the network as we had and a growing. And we all, it's also important to notify that uh, we have a uh, first AIM training workshops here. And we, uh, again, uh, similarly, we keep to have this training workshop to, uh, to contribute to capacity de development in Asian uh, countries uh, to help them to use uh, AIM model. And yeah, at the same time, we joined EMF, IPCC, SRS, uh, GEO, and so on. Okay. And then um, I think after uh, uh, third uh, assessment report uh, in IPCC, e, uh, A uh, becomes uh, much more bigger than before and plays significant, significant roles in international and domestic policies. And uh, there were many big projects uh, in, uh, although it's a domestic project, but I, uh, as I have seen uh, many big projects. Uh, the scale is something similar to uh, Horizon 2020 uh, nowadays, uh, 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 carried out uh, Japan LCS project and uh, a similar uh, kind of projects are, are also kept uh, undergoing. And, then uh, from around 2010, uh, uh, this is the timing uh, in which I joined uh, this AIM. And then I, I personally he, he contributed to make a second generation of AIM CZ. Now I name it AIM Hub. Uh, and, and then, you know, uh, many of the global studies are uh, carried out under my uh, model, this second generation AMCZ model. And at the same time, uh, we, we, we actively joined uh, the international projects like Limit Ampere, which was on uh, FP7, uh, and AgMIP, EasyMIP, uh, and so on. Well, uh, and one of the remarks here is that, you know, uh, yeah, uh, we published a, a, a book uh, summarizing the Asian uh, NDC assessment here, but I, uh, let me introduce later. So this is a uh, an example of uh, photos taken uh, in during the training workshop. So the many younger researchers uh, get together in uh, Nice and we train them. And then. Uh, our aim, uh, maybe it, it's not so different from other integrated assessment model, but uh, let me introduce uh, a model. Uh, it's, it's an uh, abbreviation of uh, Asian integrated uh, model. And uh, originally we, we intended to have a strong uh, uh, focus on Asia, but, uh, and, and we still keep that mind uh, in uh, uh, spirit. Uh, but at the same time, we also consider how to compete with the other uh, integrated assessment models uh, all over the world. And, and maybe one of the uniqueness of our uh, modeling team is focusing on uh, poverty 
uh, hunger aspects, uh, which was uh, which will be also introduced later. Uh, but we have an, uh, a specific model to focus on uh, household consumption here, and likewise other integrated assessment model. We have an energy system and agricultural land use system uh, with a CZ model. And then we interact with climate system and air quality. We, we recently we operate uh, JustCan, which is a, a tra air transport chemistry model uh, to compute the uh, uh, atmospheric condition mainly for PM2.5 and our ozone concentrations. And then, as I indicated, uh, you know, poverty and food security is one of the major focuses of our uh team uh and we also have a, a tight connection with uh ecosystem modeling uh which is uh, the model is called aim by Bi the biodiversity yes and yeah here uh sdg icons are shown which i think covers a wide range of uh, aspects of the social uh economic and environmental uh systems and the uh, core of the uh, model is a general equilibrium model, uh, which we call AIM Hub. Uh, we mainly operate it uh, uh, in many exercises uh, uh, in, in model intercomparisons. So, as, as I said, uh, so uh, uh, let me introduce our uh, main activities related to food security a representation and model implementations. And so uh, this study is actually is started from the question uh, related to BECS. So uh, in, in AR5, uh, there were some, uh, some scenarios uh, that show the negative emissions are required to attain in two degree, so-called two degree goal. And there we see a, some, some amount of bioenergy coming into the energy system and which can uh, influence on food security. And so, so we started uh, this study by asking whether climate change impacts or climate change mitigation uh, is really beneficial or harmful for uh, food security. And uh, obviously, in a warming case, uh, we may have a large yield impact. But at the same time, even though we can succeed to reduce the yield shocks, uh, we may have a, a bioenergy effects and a mitigation cost. And so we, we try to answer this question initially. And, uh, and we formulate uh, the uh, very good international team uh, under the AGMIP uh, uh, schemes. And here uh, I show the, uh, the figure uh, under, uh, taken by that AGMIP exercises. And, and yeah, simply comparing the change in population at risk of hunger under three socioeconomic conditions, which I hope the most of the audiences today know the uh, meaning of SSP here. And so we usually, take this middle of the road SSP2 as a central case. And uh, let me focus on this, these two bars. So left-hand side is uh, the uh, climate change mitigation case, where we succeed to reduce the emission while uh, bioenergy comes in and non uh, CO2 emissions reductions happens uh, and so on. Right-hand side is a warming case uh, where we don't have an, a mitigation effect, but uh, uh, yield shocks uh, are largely happening here. And so, uh, as you can see easily, this red uh, bars are uh, uh, remarkable here, uh, which is a GHG reduction effect, uh, which might be happening by a uh, bioenergy expansion uh, through land use competition or non-CO2 emissions uh, carbon price penalty. Uh, and this can, you know, increase the population at risk of hunger by uh, several, uh, uh, seven or 80 uh, million people. So, uh, and then uh, we, we ask again ourselves whether it can be avoided uh, by implementing some uh, comp yeah, uh, uh, inclusive uh, policy measures. 
And to answer to that, uh, we uh, carried out uh, again uh, model intercomparison uh, study. E at this stage, we use CD Links uh, platform. Uh, it, it's an uh, Horizon 2020 project uh, and get uh, six models, uh, integrated assessment models. And uh, this study, uh, this figure shows again the uh, risk of hunger uh, time series. And, and here we have uh, the uh, stringency of the climate mitigation uh, and risk of hunger. Uh, uncertainty ranges associated with multi models. And so again, we confirm by again using the integrated assessment model uh, that sh uh, showed uh, risk of hunger could increase by, a, you know, uh, uh, the uh, strong climate mitigation measures. And by using integrated assessment model, uh, we also uh, try to quantify uh, how much uh, uh, you know, complementary policy uh, would be needed uh, to avoid such an adverse side effect, uh, mainly aiming to stabilize the uh, food, food price. And here we show the uh, food subsidy, food aid and food deficit here. And I, I will not explain in detail, but uh, food uh, uh, make, uh, Taking the money from OECD countries and giving to developing countries, uh, if we want to use subsidy, then it's inefficient to take around uh, two percent of the GDP. But if we can uh, uh, specifically uh, provide the money only to the poor people, then the cost will be very small. Uh, this figure uh, indicates such kind of things, and so uh, this study indicated that we need to uh, have an. Uh, very smart policy if we want to avoid such kind of uh, uh, adverse side effect. And, and yeah, not only food security, we also try to answer uh, a similar question uh, regarding the VEX. Uh, so uh, VEX also uh, raise uh, a concern related to land use changes, which may uh, be a harmful uh, factor for the biodiversity. And so we also implemented a biodiversity model, uh, which can explore uh, the situation where we have a mitigation effort uh, with less climate change or uh, without climate change mitigation measures, but uh, uh, worse climate change situations. And here is uh, an example of that, the results. And let me focus on this 2050s uh, figure, uh, which. Uh, this figure only showed that uh, species are uh, trees. Uh, and here, this uh, okay yellow part is associated with land use, which can include uh, land expansion due to food production or bioenergy. And this green part is climate change, related to climate change. Uh, for example, increasing the temperature uh, may cause some species distinctions. And so obviously this climate factor is much larger than uh, land use factors uh, uh, from the perspective of biodiversity, uh, which can be in, uh, intensified in the latter half of the century. It's uh, intuitive, I guess, you know, in the latter half of the century, the uh, climate change would be much, uh, would be much worse than uh, this mid century. And so uh, uh, we, from this, uh, study, we conclude that for the biodiversity perspective, uh, the mitigation uh, is uh, quite, you know, uh, beneficial. Uh, so we can also see in the other uh, taxons, uh, but I, I like to skip this because basically we can see similar trends uh, in, in all uh, taxonomies. And and poverty, it's actually a very a emerging uh, research area uh, for us, and I, I guess for integrated assessment model uh, whole community uh, as well. And we, we, over the last few years, we we put on a much effort uh, on developing the new model, which is called AIM-5, uh, representing the household consumption behavior by multi-income levels. Uh, and we link with uh, the CZ model uh, and 
get the poverty indicators. And yeah, I would like to skip. Uh, if you are interested in, uh, please uh, go to uh, my in paper, uh, uh, which is published in Environmental Research Data in 2020. And uh, we also, uh, it was uh, very interesting for me that we see the similar uh, time series trend uh, here, poverty headcount, similar to uh, food security, risk of hunger. And uh, it's, it's all uh, on the baseline. And then uh, we compare uh, the poverty gap, which is actually the monetary, uh, a sort of a monetary indicator, how much the, um, how much money is needed to fill, fulfill uh, the, the poverty stations. And, uh, and uh, we compare this uh, poverty gap with carbon tax and then uh, the, uh, this comparison uh, uh, clarified that uh, the carbon tax revenue could be very, very large compared to the poverty gap. And therefore, if we could use this carbon tax, very small portion of the carbon tax, uh, we could help uh, many uh, poor peoples. Uh, this slide also shows uh, the uh, scale of the carbon tax revenue and the poverty gap uh, sorted by, you know, uh, the degree of the what you get in a carbon tax. And so, oh, yeah, uh, and that in total, this is the carbon tax revenue in 2030 under uh, 1.5 degree. And the poverty gap is something like this. Right. So, as I said, uh, the carbon tax revenue uh, could have a great potential to help uh, to eradicate the poverty. And uh, to expand uh, the representation of the integrated assessment model, I would like to also introduce our study related to this uh, climate change impact economics. And uh, this, uh, I actually presented uh, in Tsukuba IMC meeting, which was maybe three years ago, in 2019. Probably, I don't remember exactly, but, uh, well, uh, anyway, uh, we used computable general equilibrium as I introduced, uh, and, uh, we also employed, uh, multi, a physical, uh, uh, climate change impact models to represent, for example, energy demand changes or labor, uh, productivity changes and crop yield and so on. And, uh, those physical models information is fed into the CZE. And we finally e summarize the climate change impact uh, uh, by collecting the sector-wise uh, impact. And, and as I said, uh, we used a, a SSP, conventional SSP RCP framework, uh, taking the climate information uh, by RCP and varying the social economic assumptions by five SSPs. As I said, uh, we have uh, some uh, physical models, uh, climate change impact models here, and then uh, finally fed into NCZE, uh, getting the GDP loss or welfare loss. Well, uh, this is the scenario frameworks. And then uh, this is the main result of that study. And uh, let me focus on SSP2, uh, which shows uh, under RCP 8.5, uh, we may have a uh, like around six to seven percent GDP equivalent to loss, uh, uh, while uh, RCP 2.6 uh, shows uh, less than one percent uh, uh, climate change impact. Uh, this trend can be is similarly seen in other SSPs, and so we concluded that uh, uh, these, you know, uh, the the degree of the climate change impact would be something these uh, levels uh, associated with climate change mitigation uh, uh, levels. And the, the ma major factors causing this GDP loss was actually uh, quite uh, surprised me. Uh, and uh, this is the de decomposition of the sector-wise uh, climate change impact. So let me focus on this, uh, the end of century uh, impact here. Uh, and the SSP2. So uh, uh, the primary factor uh, is actually the, the you know, uh, occupational health cost, which is 
uh, uh, you know, like a labor losses. Uh, and then and the second one is uh, heat related excess mortality, which is uh, uh, monetized by using VSL. Therefore, it, uh, it's, it's, I think, controversial whether we can count it on as an uh, actual GDP loss or not. But anyway, uh, these two factors are measures and others are small. Uh, but uh, let me note that we didn't consider uh, the extreme events or catastrophic events uh, uh, that has a low probability but can cause a significant impact on uh, uh, human or earth systems. So uh, after this uh, study, he, uh, we we thought that uh, inclusion of such an extreme event, which we are now facing right now, we recognize that climate change is happening and we see many uh, flooding and uh, heat ex uh, excessive heat. But uh, anyway, uh, inclusion of such an extreme event may change the those results. And let me skip this regional results. Uh, regarding this uh, climate change impact studies, uh, let me highlight uh, by taking the IPCC AR6 working to cross chapter box here. And, and this is actually the summary of, of the uh, uh, relevant uh, uh, global aggregate economic impact estimate. And uh, many of the dots uh, are uh, here. Uh, uh, taken by uh, Book et al., which is, I think, uh, very well known for many uh, yeah, researchers in this field. But at the same time, we also plot it here uh, by Takakura et al., or uh, the lower ranges. And I think uh, this is really a, a controversial whether we should uh, expect the GDP loss or, or welfare loss can happen uh, this scale or this. Uh, uh, our study scale. And I, I personally think that in the next AL7, uh, uh, this topic would be a very hot topic, which we really need to address to somehow uh, answer whether this, uh, these studies are correct or we should uh, acknowledge that we have an, uh, this kind of such large uncertainty regarding the uh, economic uh, impacts. Okay, finally, let me briefly introduce our Asian climate mitigation policy assessment, which I mentioned uh, earlier that uh, we published this book, Post-2020 Climate Action, uh, in 2017, uh, compiling the Asian mitigation studies. At that time, uh, uh, the timing was just after the Paris Agreement. Therefore, we decided to make an assessment uh, related to Paris Agreement and uh, uh, in the context of Asian uh, mitigation studies, uh, I think uh, the, the NDC related topic would be most relevant. Uh, therefore, we carried out a multinational uh, scenario assessment, mainly using the uh, NDC uh, assumptions. And uh, they are uh, a part of the uh, results uh, uh, of uh, those studies and the contents of, of them are uh, adjusted and summarized in the book. And so you can uh, see from these papers as well as uh, in, in summarized book. And not only Asian, Asian national studies, uh, the book uh, also uh, contains uh, the international uh, uh, context of the Paris Agreement. So uh, to answer uh, some uh, policy relevant questions, uh, for example, emissions trading, effectiveness, or, or you know, uh, the meaning of the long term and short term uh, goals uh, associated with Paris Agreement was addressed by uh, these two studies and, and this one, right? So, uh, uh, no, uh, the, these are actually the uh, studies that I have mainly involved in Asian studies, but actually in not only the the studies uh, disclosed as paper, there are many, many underground 
uh, modeling and capacity building activities uh, in AIM teams. And so many of you cannot recognize how much a, a AIM team is actually involved in Asian um, modeling. But uh, 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 let me let me say that uh, it's significant. And and in many countries, uh, AIM models uh, is now used for national policy assessment, which partly is reflected in in the latest long term strategies. And so uh, let me finally talk about the SWG on national scenarios. So uh, uh, as Roberto introduced, uh, we launched a new uh, SWG, mainly focusing on national scenarios. Uh, let me skip this background, uh, but I would say, you know, global uh, scenarios have been well uh, now uh, uh, organized uh, and well or summarized uh, in, in the IPCC database and any uh, and other uh, project specific database. But I think national uh, scenarios haven't yet been well, uh, well you know, uh, organized. Uh, and maybe uh, it's just my guess, but uh, I guess uh, uh, IPCC lead authors in chapter four uh, struggled the uh, stations uh, of national scenarios. And so uh, I, I thought it might be better to coordinate uh, somehow, uh, for example, providing a, a standardized scenario protocol uh, which can be implemented in any countries. Uh, then, uh, you know, IMC can collect such scenarios uh, uh, which can provide a meaningful assessment by comparing multi and national scenarios. And so uh, the main objective is to promote some standardization among national scenario development and facilitate the collection of national policies and the translation of harmonization into modeling assumptions and link national activities to global activities. And finally, providing a platform for sharing best practices, including the aim of capacity building. And, uh, and uh, I, I'm not going I want to say, you know, uh, we should strictly follow this scenario protocol, but one of the examples which we implemented uh, uh, was something like, you know, uh, 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 implementing NDC emissions constraint and systematic uh, emissions reduction target in 2050, and which is some, uh, published in 2021. I think it, it could be outdated already in most of, uh, countries are now uh, stating that uh, carbon neutrality goal, uh, and therefore this uh, modest emissions reduction target may not be so relevant. Uh, but anyway, I would like you to understand that this is just an example, illustrative example, and we may want to elaborate more uh, uh, reflecting the current uh, uh, political situations. Okay, and the coordinating structure is something like here, uh, Roberto and myself are, are the co-chairs and we have uh, regional coordinators uh, representing uh, some continental activities. Uh, however, uh, we haven't yet defined clearly what the what role uh, regional coordinators would play uh, and what kind of activities are actually uh, expected uh, for the coming years. And we also uh, need to consider the real uh, polit uh, climate policy situations uh, and probably global stock take would be a, 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 a very important uh, landmark for us to consider the uh, future activities. And therefore, uh, we uh, I, I personally want to discuss more in detail in the forthcoming IMC annual meeting uh, uh, regarding this activity. Uh, and I would uh, hope again that uh, many of you can join uh, in, in the next IMC annual meeting. Right, so let me summarize. Uh, I introduce uh, the AIM modeling team. Uh, our uh, history started from 1990 and uh, we played a significant role in domestic policy and international research community. And I also introduced the recent activities related to the expansion of the representation in socioeconomic aspects, as well as uh, uh, ecosystem. And uh, 
one of the highlights was the climate change impact economics, which I hope uh, our study could be a uh, uh, good uh, uh, factor to stimulate the discussions uh, for the AL7 and a Asian climate mitigation policy assessment uh, uh, is also introduced. And yeah, I said this on national scenarios is a really, a, really interesting acti activity for me and therefore I'm very much a, a looking forward uh, to to have you on 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 this uh, exercises. Thank you very much. That's all. Thank you very much Shinichiro for the great presentation. Uh, I have been able to, to collect uh, five different questions that have been raised to you. Uh, the first oh. question uh, is uh, a comment on that during your presentation, the focus was mostly on CGs, computable mm -hmm. general equilibrium models. So the question here is, let's say, is whether or not IMs are limited to CGs or are there other uh, IMs uh, also available? So just to make a distinction about what's the CG, IM, and other possibilities here. So this was the, the, the first question. All right, uh, thank you very much. Well, uh, I would say CGs are uh, actually uh, nowadays uh, minor uh, modeling uh, and and I can maybe count like a four or five uh, modeling teams are using CGE, but uh, many other teams are using uh, so-called energy system models. Uh, uh, and, and therefore uh, the answer is it's, it's not limited to CZ and actually CZ is uh, relatively minor. Uh, but uh, let me uh, explain uh, the strength of the CZ, uh, which uh, typically represent multi-economic sector uh, that can uh, simulate uh, uh, the whole economic uh, stations uh, by considering multi-sector, multi-goods, uh, price changes. Uh, individual uh, industries would react to uh, individual uh, goods or uh, capital or labor prices. And therefore, I would say, you know, uh, macroeconomic uh, response would be, would be better represented by CZ than uh, uh, other models. But at the same time, there is a uh, uh, weakness to use CZ. CZ relies on uh, base here, social, uh, so-called social accounting matrix, uh, which, uh, you know, uh, captures the current input-output uh, structures, but it, 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 it has a uh, uh, limited flexibility to change the future industrial structure. Therefore, uh, we should, uh, you know, uh, acknowledge that limitation and, uh, and it, yeah, interpret the results. Thank you, Chinishiro. Uh, the, the, the second question I was able to collect here came from Charlotte. And basically her comment or her question is that, let's say, and she's correct, that IMs normally are highly aggregated and typically operate with representative consumers. So her question is, to what extent uh, your food security results are being influenced by the typical high level of, of aggregation of AIM. And in that case, let's say, what effects are going to, 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 to let's say, what efforts are in, uh, ongoing today to try to develop more disaggregated IMs? Right, uh, that's a really great question. Uh, we are seriously considering uh, that limitation and and so uh, let me uh, answer first to your question. So uh, I think, uh, uh, yeah, uh, IEMs are uh, basically highly aggregated. And uh, when we want to address food security, uh, or uh, in, in our studies, we often use a uh, number of people uh, under risk of hunger. Uh, there we need to, uh, uh, assumes something related to uh, food distribution within uh, nations. And uh, to represent that uh, food distribution within um, countries, 
uh, we adopt a FAO approach, which is uh, used to, to estimate the current risk of hunger. But uh, the action to food price or income losses would, would be highly simplified. Uh, and therefore, we need to consider the, uh, that uh, limitations and make more advancement. And based on that situation, uh, we decided to develop a new model, uh, which I introduced uh, during today's presentation called uh, AIM-5. Uh, that uh, try to capture the uh, individual or household behavior uh, and and for example uh, basically high income people uh, have a, a, a less sensitivity to price changes uh, while poor people or uh, is really sensitive to the food price changes for example and to to consider such a heterogeneity in household behavior, we need to have a multi-household representation in a model and coupled with the aggregated model. So uh, I, I hope uh, our forthcoming uh, studies would partly address to such limitations, but I, I, again, we, we cannot complete completely, you know, get rid of such an uh, aggregation issues. Therefore, you know, uh, you know, everything would not be solved. Uh, but I, I, I hope uh, uh, answer, I now answer to you. Thank you, Chinishu. Then the, 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 quirk, the third question here is by Gorkin. And Gorkin basically is asking uh, whether uh, the A model represent inter-regional trade and trade disruptances like taxes, embargoes, cap prices, et cetera, et cetera. Is, are these represented in the A model? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, fortunately, uh, the uh, GDAP collects the information related to uh, trade taxes uh, or domestic uh, support uh, subsidies and uh, tax information. And therefore we can reflect that current uh, information into our model. However, uh, I would like to also note that we typically preserve the tax rate for the future, long-term future simulations. And uh, I think uh, uh, what we can do is uh, only using the current data and therefore, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's quite, uh, uh, there is a limitation, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, it, it, it would be also very difficult to assume future trade policies in, in, in terms of long-term uh, trade policy. Therefore, I think what we, we can do is something like uh, we are now implementing. Thank you. Thank you, Chinishiro. Then the, the fourth question we have here is from Kashra. And basically what she's saying that if it's correct, her understanding that in your results for SSP5, the RCP 8.5, uh, that would lead to GDP losses between five and 8%. And if her understanding is correct, why scenario users normally claim that a SSP5 is a world with low challenges to adaptation. Because in her view, let's say, and she's correct, GDP loss is a limiting factor for adaptation. Okay. Um, well, uh, that's a that's, uh, really uh, great point. And, uh, and uh, let me explain how we implement SSPs here uh, in the context of uh, impact studies. Uh, we actually use the SSP variations uh, only uh, reflecting the population GDP differences here. Sist systematically change the population and GDP. However, SSP narrative describes much more broader things uh, rather than you know uh, population GDP numbers. And for example, capac uh, adaptive capacity is really an influential factor, uh, but we couldn't do anything on that. And, uh, and yeah, such kind of things uh, ideally needs to be implement, represented, but uh, that would be, I think, one of the limitations of these studies. And 
regarding uh, SSP5 specific things, and, uh, normally SSP5 has a high income, uh, even in uh, developing countries, uh, current low income countries. And therefore, uh, basically, you know, uh, high income people would have a high capability to adapt to new climate conditions. So that's uh, why I think the uh, narrative uh, of SSP5 has uh, uh, less uh, challenges in climate change adaptation. Thanks, Chinichiro. Then I have a question here from Mitchell. And basically, Mitchell is saying that he's curious about to understand whether biophysical impacts of land use change on temperature, such as albedo, ev evapotranspiration, or roughness, are included in the assessment on temperature, in the magic model that, uh, let's say, associated or a coupled with your AIM model. Well, uh, the answer is no, uh, and probably, uh, I, in my understanding, uh, it uh, might not be able to uh, be resolved uh, by using uh, magic here, and we may want to have much more sophisticated uh, uh, in integration of our system models and integrated assessment models. And so, yeah, I think that would be a, the uh, very big next challenges for us. We uh, we also uh, have uh, some discussions how to link with uh, Earth system models. Although uh, there are some trials in the United States, as far as I, I knew, uh, uh, CESM and GCAM has tried to couple them and try to uh, assess the feedbacks of land use change, albedo changes, and so on. Uh, and so we we may want to do something similar if, if possible, but nowadays uh, it's not able or uh, under a modeling framework. Thanks, Shinichir. And in fact, uh, Mitchell has also a second short question to you: whether the the aim outputs are spatially distributed to show where land use change would occur. Where land use change occurs uh do you do you mean, basically if, if let's say the it, aim outputs are let's say especially especially explicit or not oh yeah okay so uh in aim cz or aim half uh we only have aggregated regional land use area but then we have uh, a a, a downscaling uh, model here, uh, which is called PLAN, uh, that can uh, provide a uh, 0.5 degree spatial resolution uh, land use map. Thanks, Shinichiro. Then I have a question here from Patrick, and basically he's asking what's the difference between the AIM model and the AIM technology model? Uh -huh. That's, <laughs> that's also a good question. Uh, AIM technology is actually a very new model. Uh, the first uh, paper using this model has just released uh, in, in February this year. And this is uh, a pure energy system model. Uh, the base uh, of this model is uh, what I call AIM end use. Uh, which started uh, from national model for Japan and then expanded to global scale. Uh, and and uh, the, maybe one of the characteristics of this model is uh, energy end use uh, uh, devices are uh, concretely represented, like, you know, uh, steel uh, production uh, is, um, is, is, is made by several technologies uh, and and anything else. Boilers, uh, uh, what kind of boilers are used in in general manufacturing, and and residential sector also has an multiple energy services. And uh, for each energy service, we have multi energy devices to uh, uh, yeah differentiating the energy saving levels and uh, uh, fuel types. But anyway, uh, I, uh, 
the the studies are, are still very very limited and i would hope that uh, many studies would be disclosed uh, uh, under this aim technology model implementation in the future near future thanks Shinichiro. then we have a question here for from an anonymous attendee and basically his question is whether the aim let's say if with the aim hub is it possible to model how the short term shocks like let's say war natural disasters economic shocks uh, would affect the long term mitigation strategies mm -hmm. uh thank you very much uh it's, it's a really uh, good question uh and i would answer partly yes partly no uh and so uh, to well model or uh, it's possible to reflect uh, the current uh, short-term shocks like, you know, uh, COVID-19, if we can get the statistical information or related uh, energy demand information, then we can reflect such things as any short-term uh, shocks. Uh, or uh, Russian-Ukrainian situation could also be reflected if, if we assume something on that, uh, trade conditions, or uh, yeah, uh, fossil fuel market conditions, etc. However, uh, yeah, and and that would also uh, change the long term mitigations. Uh, and and so regarding yeah, answering to your original question, I think it's it's uh, it's able to do that. However, uh, how much we can uh, reflect the short term shocks into the long term shock uh, needs to needs uh, more discussions, right? And uh, there will be some variations, like short term shocks would remain for the future and uh, throughout this century. Is it realistic or not? Uh, or it's just a short term shock? Therefore, original. Uh, equilibrium condition or, or behavioral parameters needs to be go back to uh, several years ago. Uh, that kind of assumption uh, uh, also have a reality. And therefore, uh, as we can do, but uh, uh, I may be a, a bit uh, cautious uh, to, to, uh, to implement such kind of short-term shocks. Uh, and, and, you know, it, it would be also depending on the topics that we want to address. Thanks, Shinichiro. We are almost done with the time here, so I'm going to collect the, the remaining questions. We still have four or five questions, so let's try to be brief here. There's one mm -hmm. question by James, James Tempke, and basically his question is, let's say, uh, how realistic are the rather low general GDP losses for more than 2.5 degree warming? Basically, he's referring to the literature that shows sometimes much higher impacts than the results you show here. So his question is about that. How realistic are your low general GDP losses for this 2.5 degree or more uh, warming? Right, uh, that, that's also a really, really important point. And uh, basically the approach is different from uh, Brookhead's uh, econometric uh, method. And we collect the bottom up information uh, and you know, uh, summarize the all the information into a single GDP indicator. And there we didn't consider the impacts on growth rate. Uh, whereas uh, Burke et al. tried to re uh, capture the uh, impacts on growth rate, not the level of GDP. And that is the major difference between the two studies, Takakura et al. and Burke et al. Uh, and, and, Market adjustment effect is also considered in our study. Therefore, uh, I would say our study considers some parts of the adaptation measures, which is uh, uh, embedded in our current economic system. Uh, while uh, Brookie et al. Uh, would not be able to uh, capture uh, those aspects. So that could also be a uh, reason. Thanks, Shinichiro. A, a very short question here by an anonymous attendee as well. Let's say, how can AIM work along with the real world economic turbulence? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, very difficult question. <laughs> mm, well, uh, I think if we 
put much more effort uh, on that aspect, uh, the uh, uh, current situation or real world economic situations, uh, then uh, we might be able to uh, address something on the current economic situations. Uh, however, uh, it would also take an, a large effort uh, and we also need to keep uh, the balance of the modeling for the long-term future simulations and short-term uh, simulations. Uh, essentially, it, there might be some similarities, but some uh, also needs to be differentiated. Long-term uh, things and short-term things are, are different uh, things. And therefore, I, I would say uh, we might be able to do, uh, but that is not easy to do. <laughs> Thanks, Fenishiro. And then the, 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 the two final questions here. One is by M Max Kolofsky. And basically he's asking, let's say, when the AIM model will go, let's say, fully, will be fully open or source open access. <laughs> well, uh, we are preparing uh, to make it open source. But uh, haven't yet had a, a solid uh, time schedule uh, when we can do it. But uh, yeah, uh, I, I hope you would understand. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Shinichi. And then the, the final question here is by Roberto Bozon, Rozon, in fact. And he says, let's say, the CGs are in general ill-suited to model the economy in the medium long medium long term because of structural changes. How have you considered this issue in your exercise or in your work? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, as I partly addressed uh, this uh, weakness uh, of CV, it, it's difficult to uh, represent uh, the structure changes uh, endogenously. And so we partly uh, uh, address this issue by uh, changing the uh, input output coefficient, uh, for example, or gradually sh uh, shifting to the uh, industrial oriented structure to service oriented structures. But uh, I, I would say it's quite uh, naively uh, uh, done and uh, we need much more uh, better jobs in that area. Thank you very much, Shinichiro. Well, with that, uh, we come to the end here. So I'd like to thank you very much, all the attendees. I, I have no idea how many people have joined us because I, I do not have this statistic here, but we expect to have a large number of people here. Some 100 people have registered for this. Hopefully, most of them were here today. So I'd like to thank you all for the excellent questions. And finally, thank you very much, Shinichiro. Uh, for your great presentation and also, let's say, to congratulate you again for your well-deserved award of ECA uh, uh, 2021. So thank you very much. Hope to see you, most of you, in the next event of the IMC. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you, Roberto. Thank you all. Bye.